This podcast was brought to you by the future. Or is it the past? I can never remember. Hello and welcome to Monkey Broadcast, a monthly review discussion show with me, the Jelly Monkey. And me, Sven, the re-equipped crusader. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a computer that actually has USB ports. Yeah, it's pretty damn amazing. Trust me, no one is more amazed than I am. And so here we are in the month of July. By the time this goes out, we'd both be exactly one year older. Oh my god, you're right. I suddenly feel old. <laughs> Probably not as old as you feel, though, so I'm not gonna complain. Eh, I personally see it as life has tried to kill me 30 years so far and has failed, so... <laughs> Reasonable. Oh, jeez. But yes, there's no time to waste. We've got a big review in front of us, because yes, we are finally going to review Fire Emblem Fates. But before that, we better start with what is traditionally our first section of the show. q and This is the section where we answer questions from the audience. If you'd like us to answer your questions, either leave them in the comments or send them to me via Twitter with the hashtag MBQuestion. Our first question comes from McDuck. If you could choose any two characters for an epic versus movie in which they fight against each other, who would they be? So, basically, the most fitting question anyone could ever ask death battle fans. <laughs> basically, except rather than a death battle with or any other <coughs> versus movie on YouTube, which is basically two sides walk into a field and then fight each other, Usually these versus movies, there needs to be some context to it, so it might be a little tricky this time round. Yeah, and I mean, just for a bit of meta, we've already tried recording this podcast once because anything we do related to Fire Emblem is cursed. Uh, cursed of the Black Fang, yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I made this discovery last attempt in the middle of giving my example. <laughs> So I'm just going to get it out of the way straight out of the gate. I would say Godzilla vs. Evangelion, but apparently it's happening. Yeah, I'm just as amazed as all of you. Yeah, it's pretty damn amazing. I mean, yeah, like you pointed out back then, it's fitting because they're both owned by the same creator now. Yeah, and both of them, you know, kind of symbolize some sort of great soul-sucking humanly despair. But yeah, I'm not sure if that example counts anymore because apparently Hideaki Anno is doing it. So for one of that, I will uh, I will suggest what I like to call Batman versus Superman, but better: Lex Luthor versus Doctor Doom. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to see a villainous example because I guess if nothing else, it would be kind of like Ocean's Eleven or some other kind of heist movie in that sense. That is an amusingly fitting comparison. Just two bad people trying to screw each other over. <laughs> and, and I mean, just just imagine the clash of personalities going on. Everything has taken place according to my plans. And what a farce! <laughs> also, they're both green. That's all I have to say on the matter. Eh, kind of. <laughs> and for my case, the... Fan of detective movies in me, it really wants to see something like Poirot versus Sherlock or Sherlock versus Batman. But then again, you'd be really hard pressed to find a situation where they would go up against each other without running into what it's just a random guy parody. Well, with the red sun rays you were blasted with, who knows which one of us would win? But we can't fight. We've got to stop Luther and Doc Ock. Yeah, basically. As amazing as a crossover like that sounds. For one, I would have to ask ahead of time that they don't, for the love of God, put Stephen Moffat in charge. <laughs> You'd also have to really dance around why they're going up against each other in the first place, rather than actually helping each other out. Yeah, because you can always create crossover movies, but versus movies are a bit of a tricky one. It's why I was always against the idea of a Batman v Superman movie. <laughs> yeah, and, you know... Not least because Zack Snyder can't direct seriously worth a damn. I mean, anyone who's seen 300 knew ahead of time that putting DC Comics in his hands was a bad idea. 
Yeah, although in fairness, whilst, uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of his directing style either, I will say in his defense, that was not his idea. Warner Brothers have been pushing for a Batman v Superman movie since the 90s. I am not kidding. Oh, that does not surprise me. They were either going to try and do it against Christopher Reeve's Superman, or they were going to try and make a new Superman movie to go along with it, but needless to say, that did not go down well. Oh god, and I know exactly who they had in mind for Superman at the time. <laughs> Michael Keaton versus Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have been bad. And, oh god, I just had a horrible idea. Just to go back to my Batman and Sherlock idea. <laughs> Batman vs. Sherlock, written by Frank Miller and Stephen Lovett. Oh, God! <laughs> that would be disaster waiting to happen. Also, I'm pretty <laughs> sure all the characters would just save them both the trouble and die ahead of time. <laughs> oh, jeez. But yeah, I think for a versus movie to work, it would either have to be... Something like Freddy vs. Jason, where they're both so despicable you don't care who wins. Or a heroic figure versus a villainous figure, which is why I guess the other suggestion would be the Power Rangers versus some other kind of monster. I would say Godzilla, but we've already covered that with Evangelion, so... So excited! <laughs> I would say I'd like to see Godzilla's eternal rival Gamera in a in a versus movie, but Gamera's a hero, and I have never watched any of Gamera's movies. Neither have I, admittedly. <laughs> <laughs> People also suggest Star Trek versus Star Wars, but to be honest, the series are so completely different, it's hard to say. <laughs> oh god, that would be one of the most absurd curb stomps since Doctor Doom versus Darth Vader. <laughs> uh, it, it's just so bad. But or, anyway. or Mewtwo versus Shadow. Still not over that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess video game wise, uh, it would probably be easy to stick two fighting game franchises against each other, but uh, you've already had Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which was... Eh. <laughs> yeah. Although I will admit, I would not be opposed to, say, uh, Okay, say these two franchises started out against each other and uh, ended up teaming up at the end like so many Godzilla movies do. Fire Emblem vs. Legend of Zelda OVA. Oh! Falchion vs. the Master Sword. <laughs> that could work. You'd have to pretty much reduce the cast because unless you uh, gave them the powers they had in Hyrule Warriors, it would basically be, we have an entire army. What do you have? I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be fair, it, it, the more you think about it, the more complications there are, but <laughs> I just had to get that mental image out. True, although actually, just because I know so many people compare these series, Fire Emblem vs. Tear Ring Saga. Settle the debate once and for all. <laughs> Admittedly, I've never played Tear Ring Saga, never even watched videos of it. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I just know that people keep comparing the two series all the time. So, yeah, like you said, settle the debate once and for all. <laughs> I think that's all we can come up with for now. So, we'll move on to our second question. And this one comes from Infinity Zero. On the sliding scale of idealism versus cynicism... Where do you two stand, and how does that reflect in your choices of media? Oh boy. You want to go first, or should I? I guess I can go first, but I have a feeling we might be on a similar scale. I guess there is a cynical part of me that does keep me kind of grounded, so I don't get too overly excited for things. Like, I'm not the sort of person who fangasms every time they see something positive at, say, E3, for example, but... And I am well aware that, especially after uh, certain political events that have been going on throughout the month, that the worst can and often does happen. But at the same time, I feel that just because life has a tendency to be unfair, that because more often than not, it is the douchebags that get their way, 
I feel that just giving in to cynicism and saying, oh, what's the point in everything? There is no such thing as hope and justice and all of that. I don't feel it's right to give in to that. That's why I always try to be positive in as many situations as I can. Try to see solutions. Try to try to find some way to be constructive, even if it's just leading by example. I mean, that's my take on it. I don't know if you're the same, Sven. Yeah, you've more or less hit the nail on the head. I mean, uh, I live in America, so I know firsthand <laughs> that sometimes whatever incomprehensible force of fate that determines world events can be about as cruel as the dice gods are to Will Wheaton. <laughs> but I also realize that the world does not work the way that George R.R. R. Martin and the producers of Game of Thrones would like you to believe it does. Like you said, bad people get their way far too often. I mean, for God's sake, we live in a world where Donald Trump might seriously become president of the United States. But <laughs> to me, that's no excuse to just give up hoping because you see plenty of good in the news. It's just that news media makes a fortune off of negativity, fear mongering and making people panic. That is true, actually, because it's really weird how often you do see that there are tales of people who do genuinely good things. Like, I remember we briefly talked about it that time when um, the tsunami hit Japan, and there were tales of heroics about people from office buildings fishing people out of the water when it came in, and just... I also believe, <laughs> I think I used this example in the Game of Thrones review as well, when uh, thousands of people all managed to get together and lift up a double-decker bus to help a cyclist that was trapped underneath. It's not human nature to be this negative, you know? <laughs> so yeah, exactly what you said. It is not human nature to be cruel and cynical and hopeless. Even though it's very, very difficult sometimes to maintain hope in the universe, I mean, I once again refer you to Donald Trump, but <laughs> again, I don't think that the occasionally needlessly cruel nature of whatever controls this universe is an excuse to just give up on humanity or give up on the world because eventually there will be a turnaround. Unless, of course, there's a Fallout-style apocalypse, in which case we won't be around to complain about it. True, but even in stuff like Fallout, you do see optimism. I mean... You actually summed it up really well when you were talking about Fallout New Vegas in, I think it was Roy's question about Overworlds. Part of the reasons why Fallout New Vegas was so good is that it looked like humanity had reached a point where it was moving on from it. Exactly, and actually, uh, Fallout New Vegas to me is a perfect encapsulation of that. I mean, obviously there's some exaggeration there because we don't live in a post-apocalyptic hell world, but... <laughs> it's basically the dilution of exactly what I'm talking about. There are some terrible people in the Mojave Wasteland, but as on the whole, people in general are uh, as satisfied as they can be. They're moving on. They're making their, uh, again, post-apocalyptic hellscape of a world better by the day. And that, I think, is just indicative of humanity. Yeah, so I think bringing it round to the second half of the question, I guess... How that reflects on our choice of media is that we're all perfectly fine with media that does actually look at, I guess, the critical sides of humanity, but we do kind of put uh, a little bit of optimism in there. It's why I think I gravitate so much to some of the more cheesy, heroic X-series, why I still follow stuff up like you know, the Tale series, or even stuff like, again, Fallout or Dragon Age Origins, where, yeah, there is a lot of crap going on in the world, but, but if you play your cards right, you can actually do some good for the world. Because, yeah, ultimately, humanity is a flawed species, but it can do some real good. I mean, if... It's also part of the reason why I... There is one line in James Cameron's Avatar that really rubbed me up the wrong way. And actually, it is actually the point where my opinion for the movie goes, Oh, this is really good. It's a nice exploration of a fictional culture. And my oh, God, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should mention that. I will get into my own personal experience with that once you're done here. 
what turns that mark for me was when the military starts basically going, you know what, screw negotiations, but just going to conquer them. And the reason they do it is because they have a video log from the main character, Jake Sterling, where he goes, We have nothing to armor the Navi. What, Pepsi and jeans? <laughs> oh, you fucker. <laughs> Considering all of the things humanity has done, like the works of Shakespeare and the thousands and thousands of other literature, the fact that me and Sven are communicating over an entire freaking ocean due to the advancement of technology, the understanding of science in the world, hell, the fact that you are on a completely different planet and spend half of your time in a fake alien body kind of proves that humanity is a lot more capable than Diet Pepsi, okay? <laughs> For one, brilliant rant, my friend. For two, <laughs> to continue on from what you were saying, it was ex for that exact same reason as you mentioned that I turned against Game of Thrones. I mean, at first it seemed like a dark, nitty-gritty uh, exploration of the dark side of humanity with, with a few too many titties. <laughs> but after a while, I started to realize that the message that the showrunners are going for is that everyone becomes a monster in the end. Let me just very quickly make my own Bill Wirtz jingle here. Baloney! <laughs> yeah, realizing that also was what pushed me back towards series like what you were mentioning, Avatar. Not James Cameron's Avatar, the good Avatar. Um, <laughs> Avatar, The Legend of Korra, Steven Universe, just series more emblematic of humanity's good side, because for the most part, humanity's good side is what most people see, but we don't see it, because for one, like I said, the media makes a fortune off of panic and misery, and for two, bad people for some reason always end up in power. <laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> and I think that's what fuels the cynicism of a lot of people. Whenever you don't have the best role models, it's hard to maintain faith in humanity. And I'll sign this off by saying that if any of you out there want a perfect encapsulation of what Jonan was just talking about, the advancement of technology and the potential of human kindness, look up Charlie Chaplin's Let Us All Unite speech. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical. Our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Perfect representation of that. But yeah, climbing off my soapbox, our next question comes from IZ. Do you think the Kremlin should return if there's another Donkey Kong Country Returns? Uh, this is a surprisingly complex question. I think I'll let the Donkey Kong fanatic go first. <laughs> um... I don't think nearly as complex as our last question, but, um, <laughs> short answer would be yes. Long answer is not the Yahtzee joke, but, um, <laughs> whilst I do like the Snowmans, and some of Retro's other attempts at creating villains, even if their tiki's ended up being kind of meh, I feel that the Kremlins have been away for enough of a long time that it would make sense for them to come back now. I can understand wanting to try new things, but at this point, it's been two games and God knows how many years since uh, the Kremlins last appeared. In fact, I think their last appearance was Jungle Climbers. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right. Also, this has been a Jost fan theory for like three games in a row now, but what I would pay for Retro to come out Make a DKC Returns game with another new uh, species of antagonist. And as it turns out, K. Rule really is the mastermind. That would be cool. I'm not sure if it's going to happen, though. No, mainly because Retro seems to go with... I do like what Retro's doing with the series, don't get me wrong, but one of the things that kind of 
irked me a little bit was that during interviews they said, yeah, we were starting to write a story thinking about why DK would do this and that. But then someone said, we're talking about a monkey with a tie, so they decided to just avoid it and go with Rule of Cool. Oh, really? You have so much potential there. I mean, who would not want to delve into a story about a heroic monkey with a tie? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't think they're going to do any dramatic plot twist, because that might require some explanation, and I think with Wretched, what you see is what you get. To get back to the question, I think, yeah, it's probably a good time for the Kremlins to come back now. It's not going to be the end of the world if they're not in the next game, but I think now's a good time for them to return. Yeah, even though it may be hoping a little too much of Retro, I would really love to see a comic book plot twist where it turns out that K. Rule really was behind everything. That would be one of the only times I'd be down for Hijacked by Ganon. Yeah, I can entirely understand that. On a similar note, we now move on to our fourth question, and this one comes from Vice of Legends. Have you ever thought of making your own Donkey Kong game where it was more in the story of the original DKC series, even if you had to resort to RPG Maker? Short answer, my friend, I wish. Yeah, to be honest, neither of us really have the skill for any of that kind of game programming. Yeah, I mean, I can pull out a decent villain voice if I have to, but that's about the extent of my, uh, of my experience with video game design. Yeah, um, the best I could do for a video game is write a story, so if I was going to do that, I'd have to organize a team to get ever of um, sort of programmers who would be up to it, but the thing is, if I was going to do that, part of me thinks I would rather just sort of make my own story based on the game, like my own story universe, rather than using pre-existing characters and, well, given the nature of Nintendo, probably being hit with a cease and desist order. The only possible exception I'll make to this is bringing one of our two main crossover ideas to reality. Donkey Kong vs. Mass Effect, people! Make it happen! That or Tales of Donkey Kong Country, one of the two. I'm gonna make this work somehow. Yes! <laughs> oh my god, I, to this day, I think we came up with DK vs. Mass Effect in 2012. To this day, I still cannot believe we came up with DK vs. Mass Effect. <laughs> True, but honestly, like I've always said, my favorite crossovers are the ones where you get people who shouldn't work in a crossover. <laughs> I want to get point everyone in the direction of Turnabout Storm. Not just because it proves my point, but because it's also awesome. Indeed, that or Project X Zone 2. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Our next question from Vice reads... What do you think about the hate towards Paper Mario Color Splash? Is it justified? I have never in my life played a Paper Mario game, so, uh, over to you, Jonan. Yeah, I suppose this is a good time as any to go over this. Right. Well, I would recommend that you played the first Paper Mario and the GameCube title, Paper Mario A Thousand Year Door, because, yeah, they're kind of simplified because, well, it's Mario. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's not terribly much complexity going on there. True, but the series, it's still a really solid RPG with a good battle system, and, well, here's the main charm of the Paper Mario series. It was kind of told like a fairy tale, so that was always one of the more positive aspects, and the other was that because it was an RPG, it was able to do more interesting stuff than the Mario series usually allows, like... One of the fun things to do in Paper Mario was explore Toad Town, which was a town just outside Princess Peach's castle, and was filled with all of these different citizens with their own quests that occasionally changed their positions whenever new plot points emerged, and would give different interactions depending on which party you had, and yes, you could recruit the cast of party members, and they were a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> but something happened where... We then had Super Paper Mario, which, it was okay, I've mentioned before on the podcast that I was not a fan of the gameplay style, and since then I've watched Let's Plays of the story, and that was okay, it might have uh, tried a bit too hard to be dark in a Paper Mario story, but, but was otherwise pretty cool, but then Sticker Star came along, and... <sighs> I will freely admit, I have not played Sticker Star, but the main reason why not is that 
nothing about the trailers convinced me it would be a good idea. It's kind of one of these things that occasionally happens to Nintendo series in that it focuses purely on the gimmick. Like, Sticker Star, the party members are all gone. It's just Mario and this... I forget what the name of the character was, but basically this Navi helper character that was following you around. And the whole gimmick was that Bowser or Bowser Jr., one of the two, had gained the power to turn people into stickers. And so the entire battle system was based around the stickers you collected and you could not attack with a hammer unless you had a hammer sticker. And it was just, it just looked so gimmicky from the visuals and didn't seem to be any effort put into the story. In fact, that was the most painful element you could tell. The, the only story was, oh, things have been turned into stickers, but nothing else about it looks appealing. So. <laughs> wow. Disappointing. Yeah, so that was the reason why I avoided that, and whilst it's true that Color Splash could be the game that turns everything around, and maybe they have learned from their mistakes, at the same time, none of the trailers have convinced me of that yet. Because, <laughs> okay, I freely admit it's a silly idea to hate a game that's not even out yet. But at the same time, I'm not too optimistic because, again, the trailers are all focusing on the gimmick of, Oh no! Color has been drained from the world using magic straws that Bowser suddenly managed to get. With the help of your animated paint bucket, no, seriously, you must use your hammer to restore color! <laughs> and it's just, ugh. It does not grab my imagination. It does not convince me that they have learned a goddamn thing from their mistakes. Paper Mario, what happened to you, man? There's one really amusing image online that does actually sum up why some people don't like the direction Mario series is taking it. It's every single... Toad based NPC from Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door. And it's just the variety of different designs and genders and just all of these completely unique characters flooding one page. And then it goes to Sticker Star and it's all the same Toad design. <laughs> wow! Giving whole new meanings to laziness. Basically, yeah. And there's also been some controversy with. I won't tap into because we have no way of knowing what the creator's mind is. All I will say is, it's either an incredibly bad pun, or it's referencing things that Nintendo of America's localization department has no f***ing business referencing. <laughs> Not too optimistic, but I guess there's still time for Nintendo to prove me wrong, and I would like to be proven wrong. But anyway, it's now time to look at our last question for this month, which, as always, comes from 2 Junkie. If I were to turn the moon into a ball of yarn, would I have enough material to summon Fuzzy Felchus, the patron saint of all things fluffy? Well, I don't know too much about uh, arcane rituals, but I do know you will summon just about every interdimensional cat there ever was. True, but I don't know if you'd get Fuzzy Felchus, and for him it has to be quality over quantity. Plus, don't go messy with the moon. We need that. Yeah, I mean... If you turn the moon into a ball of yarn, you may, in fact, also turn the oceans into uh, sheets and sheets of felt. So, use caution, is what I'm saying. And if you believe Doctor Who, the moon is an egg, there's something inside it, and felt does not work with eggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a dumb episode. But anyway, that concludes the Q&A session for this month, so it's now time for us to get to the round you've all been waiting for. Reviews! Or as I like to call it, Fire Emblem. Yes, it's time. After all the delays between releases, after all of the stressing out over localizations and all of the stuff that ultimately doesn't matter in the end, we finally got to play Fire Emblem Fates and we're at a point where we can review it. At the time of this recording, I completed both Birthright and Conquest, and I'm about halfway through Revelations. Uh, where are you about to you, Sven? I am at the end of Revelations. I've played some of the other two routes, but I eventually gave up because I could not bring myself to murder my siblings. This is not Game of Thrones. 
I suppose we should probably give some context to people before we go any further. This is, of course, of assuming you've been trapped in some deep realm and you've absolutely no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Can we even put it yet? <laughs> Here is the premise. Fire Emblem is a strategy series that has been going for a long, long time, and one that me and Sven have been a big fans of. In fact, it's how we met. The latest game is Fire Emblem Fates, which has been split into three games that are completely separate campaigns. Fire Emblem Birthright, Fire Emblem Conquest, and Fire Emblem Revelations. This is all based on a decision that occurs in Chapter 4, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The story is centered around a character named Corin. Now, it doesn't have to be named Corin. You can completely customize this character to be whatever age, gender, and hair color you wanted them to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, character customization, my favorite part of any RPG. Indeed. But just to make it easy, we're going to name them Corin. Corin is in a unique situation because... In this world, there are two great powers that have been at war with each other for a while. The Japanese-inspired Hoshido, and the Roman-inspired Empire of Nor. Now, during this war, one of the Hoshido children, Corinne, was kidnapped and then raised in Nor in complete isolation, save for occasional visits from the other prince and princesses of Nor. So, eventually, events lead Corinne to be caught in the middle of this conflict and it's a pretty tough dilemma because there was a spell that messed up Corinne's memory so even though the Hoshiden royalty is Corinne's birth family and they've been witness to a tragedy where Nor's uh how should I put this warmongering father King Garen um, uh we'll get back to him <laughs> basically used Corinne as a suicide bomber that blew up part of Hoshido and actually killed their co and queen. So they have every reason to side of Hoshido. But even though King Garen is an asshole, Corinne still considers the Nor royalty his or her family because they were the ones who raised him slash her throughout most of their lives. So when it, chapter 5 comes around and it's time for them to make a big decision... This is where you can choose to either side of Hoshido, hence Fire Emblem Birthright, side with Nor and try to reform it from within, which is Fire Emblem Conquest, or basically go, screw both of you, I'm not fighting you, so I'll find my own way, which is Fire Emblem Revelations. Basically, you have a choice between three routes. Honor, reform, or bugger off. <laughs> yeah, basically... And I've got to say, this choice already intrigued me from the pre-release material. But playing through that prologue, if there is one thing I have to say from Fates' favor right off the bat is that the first five chapters are absolutely excellent in setting up the premise. Like, I already figured it might be a bit awkward turning against the Nor Nobles, but... After playing through the game and seeing what kind of people they were, it was a really tough choice to make because, like I said, I could completely sympathize with Hoshido after the hideous tragedy that went on there, but at the same time, after spending so much time with the Nor royalty, I just... It felt wrong turning my blade against them, especially since I chose Birthright first, mainly because that's the game that came first in the mail, and... <laughs> <laughs> Reasonable. And... <laughs> and yeah, I made that choice, I thought, oh god, this is going to be harsh. But the moment you made that decision, and it completely broke my heart, because there's this moment where Corinne like, makes this desperate plea to explain to Nor that, look, our father is evil, he's done some outright wicked things, and because he still has loyalty to him, what with, you know, being his son and all, her eldest brother, Xander, goes berserk and starts attacking her with full force whilst Corinne is begging all the time, please, I don't want to fight you. And it's just, combine that with the music and the visuals, it was one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever done in a video game, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, Fire of the Fates does a masterful job of playing with your emotions. And trust me, even if you refuse to side with either nation, it still tries to destroy you. 
Oh, God, yes, because, yeah, like Sven said, this plays with your emotions in a skillful manner, and whilst admittedly Awakening had some emotional points too, Fates does it a lot better, and I think it comes down to this conflict where, okay, whilst part of me still feels it's a bit dubious to split the whole thing up into three separate games and the decision has a paywall attached to it, I will respect the fact that all three campaigns are very different, and the fact that you have two sets of units on opposite sides, all of whom are characters with their own subtleties and nuances in their own right, it really plays into the core theme of Fire Emblem that has been in there since day one, which is every member of your army, they're not a statistic for you to throw out there in order to win. They are all individual people with their own goals and dreams, which heightens the tragedy when you realize, oh crap, the other side is exactly the same. Right? It's simultaneously the worst because if you don't go for revelations, you're going to have to murder people. But at the same time, it's something that Fire Emblem really has not explored before. It is what that stupid war plot in Fire Emblem 10 should have been. Oh god, yes, because yes, there are some otherworldly forces at work without trying to spoil too much. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that no one wants to fight, but they have no choice because, well, the leaders are assholes. That's the only thing it comes down to. Even in Norn, none of them really want to fight Corinne deep down, but their kingdoms are at war. It's not like in Radiant Dawn, where it's, there are several logical ways we could get out of this, but we can't because of stupid plot magic. Right? Forever better. This situation is, you can explain your side all you want, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change the fact that, well, everyone's at war, so... Yeah. And like I said, unless you choose the Scarper route in Revelations, you're gonna have to kill good people. And it was about that time that I started realizing that, that I also realized I could not finish either of the two main routes. I could not bring myself to do that. And... It is rare for a game to make me stop and realize I can't keep playing the way I've been playing because the plot requires me to do something that is so against what I want to do that it's just completely impossible for me to go on. Indeed. I managed to play through both Birthright and Conquest, but it was a hard journey because it may be the standard Fire Emblem plot of Stop the Evil Empire, but... There are many casualties along the way. Oh god, the final cutscenes. <laughs> oh god, and in Conquest is especially interesting because you can try to reform the kingdom from within, but at the same time, the assholes are still in charge, so there are times when things go badly awry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to say the least. But in the end, even in some of the darker things like Conquest, there is still some positivity to be pulled out of the fire. So, yeah, it manages to strike that balance between hard-wrenching and complex, but at the same time still pulling out the optimism that, frankly, a lot of other series are missing. So. I'm pretty sure no one needs an explanation of which series we're thinking of, and it really is true because fate strikes that perfect balance between optimism and cynicism, and it reflects exactly on what I talked about earlier. People, as a general rule, tend to be good and complex and have their own uh, very well and good reasons for doing things, even if their leaders are a bunch of assholes. Indeed. And it, it's actually funny, Conquest has a line which... Yeah, it's incredibly cheesy, but I think it's fitting when that undergoes. Yes, we live in dark times right now, but it's during. <coughs> we, yes, we. Yeah, yes, we've been living in dark times, but the darkest skies are when the stars shine brightest. Oh my god, Sander, that is the cheesiest sh and I love it. <laughs> but yeah, we can't talk about the story that much more about spoilers, so. 
I guess we could... So I guess we should focus on the gameplay. The core is mainly the same, but... There have been some interesting tweaks. Fire Emblem Awakening, the game that came previously, was basically the swan song the Fire Emblem. At least, that was how it was originally going, because Nintendo basically told them, you better sell half a million units or you're done. So, that's why there was a lot of stuff like the ties to the original Fire Emblem, the multiple crossover characters and references to past games, etc, etc, etc. But... Fate is the game where they've gone, okay, we've done the big celebration, how do we move on from this? And so, like I said, they've been making small tweaks here and there. First off, first off, the pair-up mechanic that was introduced in Awakening has been altered, so it's frankly a lot less broken. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. The pair-up mechanic in, uh, in Awakening was basically a win-all button. Basically, I mean, let's be honest, there was absolutely no reason to not pair up units because they got stat boosts, and if they were high enough of support, the unit they would pair with would add an extra attack literally every time, so... Yeah, pretty much. And I can tell you with certainty that there is not a unit in Awakening that can withstand the combined onslaught of, say, an S-supported Krom and Robin. Oh god, yeah, that basically tore through most of the game. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, it was fun, but it was broke to hell. But now they've made it, so they've now set it up so that if your units are paired up, they cannot double attack. You won't get the second attack. You can only get the stat boost and the defensive option occasionally. So there's a lot more strategy you have to put into it in that... You have to think, okay, do I want the extra damage, or do I want the defensive options? And sometimes it's a lot better to go defensive, because they've also tweaked the challenge in this game. By God, they have. Yeah, to say the least. I mean, for starters, there is a reason I called this game Fire Emblem Reinforcements. Hooray for reinforcements. <laughs> Yeah, basically a lot of this game has been reducing the broken elements and making it so that you're on a level playing field because, well, like I said, you have the option of do I want the two units separately but gaining extra damage by attacking or do you want them paired up so that one of the unit is basically covering you from not only main attacks occasionally but support attacks from other enemies. And you also have to think very carefully because... Just to put this into context, because I don't have the time to deal with expert level BS because i in it for the story, not so much the bragging rights, I was playing on easy casual mode, when what that means is the difficulty was at its lowest and I had battle saves so I could save each turn and then just restart to that particular point and none of the units were killed at the end of battles. I still had to think very carefully about what I was doing because if you go with the logic some Fire Emblem games have had in the past, which is, well, if I just send out my Berserker and Swordmaster together, they can probably just turn into a living meat grinder and take on the 10 units in a row. You are going to be bitterly disappointed, my friend. Yeah, because... Uh... Not only has the difficulty been boosted considerably, the enemy units can pair up too. Indeed, they can pair up and they can pile on the damage if you're not careful. And this is combined the fact that they've altered the weapon mechanic as well, so the good news is you no longer have to worry about the weapon's uses going down. So, once you have, say, an iron sword or a javelin, then you can pretty much just stick with that weapon for life. The problem is, to compensate for that, each weapon has been given their own strengths and weaknesses. So, yeah, a javelin can be either a close-range weapon or a projectile weapon. It also makes you more susceptible to double attacks, though. Yeah, and ranged weapons cannot double attack themselves. Except bows. Except bows, yeah. Bows are okay, but if you're going for ranged melee weapons, like... The spear, that's an example. The spear can now only be a ranged weapon. If you try and use it as close range, it will not work. Yeah, so 
basically the combat system has become way more in depth. Yeah, so it now really is a thing where you have to think carefully about your strategy and more, okay, is my unit going to survive this? Do I need to have someone pair up with him? And do I go with the javelin so that he can kill the mages or just grip my teeth and have him bear it so that he's not going to be killed by the knight that's going to come up afterwards? Yeah, pretty much that. And then, of course, you get into Fire Emblem Fates' obsession with reinforcements. <laughs> I swear, I've played Fire Emblem 6, the original Fire Emblem reinforcements, hooray for reinforcements, and Fates <laughs> is a return to form. Yeah, I mean, I they were kind of reduced on easy mode, so, I mean, it was still annoying when they showed up, and it wasn't quite as bad, but I still had to keep my guard up at all times, and it somehow managed to feel fair throughout 90% of the game, and I never felt like, oh god, that was so cheap. I mean, the only times I ever felt frustrated with the game, rather than myself for making that mistake, so... Well, one, when the characters miss on 96%, that has happened way too many times to me, I don't know how, but... <laughs> and the only other time was during certain paralogues where the situation seems to be stacked against you, such as Shiro's introduction chapter, or as I like to call it, Shiro, why are you running into battle, you under-level twit? Pretty much. I made the mistake in my playthrough of thinking that if I just let the idiot die, he'd learn his lesson and join me afterwards. Oh god, I paid for that mistake. Despite the uh, in-chapter conversation, he wasn't there, so I saved over my file, and I don't have Shiro. Thanks, Shiro! Uh, <laughs> I only had him just through a series of trial and error, and in the end, it was more of a case of desperately getting Jacob within range so he could use rescue and have him stop taking on the hero that was twice his level. And that's the sad thing. I had Jacob with a rescue staff, and it never occurred to me to use it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, aside from situations like that where it seems to beat me up against you, Fates' difficulty is incredibly well balanced, and it feels a lot more rewarding to get characters and even the experience, because you can get the experience grinding DLC boo camp in this case, and uh, in Conquest, that is literally the only way you can grind for experience, because you can play any of the other DLC, you won't get experience from it in that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another reason why I couldn't finish Conquest, because uh, that game kicked my ass so hard I was wearing my ass as a hat. Yeah, Conquest is the heart of the two experiences, because it's trying to throw back to older Fire Emblem games. Epic success! But yeah, even in the experience grinding chapter, there is still a lot of strategy, and you have to pay close attention, because unlike in Awakening, where it's, Oh, look, all of these golden bags of experience are marching towards me and not attacking. You still have to be careful with strategy in that game, because there are lots of moments when a unit will go, Okay, you know what, f*** this, turn around and start punching you repeatedly and killing your units. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Lord and sort of it is, Fates is an absolutely fantastic game. The story is terrific with an amazing concept, and I guess we should also mention the characters are as great as always. They still have the thing from Awakening where they appear to be based on a gimmick, but this is the reason why you need to pay attention to support conversations, guys, because just playing through those does add extra dimensions to them, and, and in some cases make you Fran I'll adore them. Like, after her support conversation with Silas, I just want to give Baruka a hug. I really do. <laughs> you you relayed this story to me, and now so do I, and also I'm pretty sure that I'm not gonna be able to pair her with anyone but Silas in my playthroughs going forward. And uh It's worth mentioning, I think, that the royal characters, even though they're at war and Camilla's slightly scary and Takami is a royal douchebag, <laughs> they're all uh they're all complex characters in their own right, and I think there is no better example of this than my personal favorite line of supports. Prince Leo of Nor and Princess Sakura of Hoshido. I S-supported the two of them in my last playthrough of Revelations, and basically their supports can be boiled down to 
Leo at first thinking, oh my god, what are you doing on the battlefield? You are too kind to be here, you're going to be eaten alive. But ultimately realizing that Sakura has a lot to offer, her empathy is in fact a blessing on the battlefield and reminds everyone of their humanity, and at the same time, Sakura grows stronger and starts sitting out on war councils and becoming a leader. And the two slowly come together on the virtue of that plotline, and I loved it. Yeah, I've only just got Leo in my current playthrough of Revelations, and yeah, I'm planning to pair those two up because I'm already having fun pairing up some of the other royals like, uh, funny you should mention Takumi and Camilla. <laughs> oh <Pairing> god! <laughs> <laughs> the terrifying one of the asshole. That's gonna end perfectly. <laughs> uh, he does actually start out pretty terrified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I turned around. My opinion of Takumi turned around after after I delved into his supports, especially with Obero, who is also scary as <laughs> But <laughs> I'm still never going to stop making a running joke of how much of an asshole he is at the start. Oh, God, yes. And admittedly, he can continue his asshole behavior depending on how the story goes, but again, it's an example of why the support conversations really do help flesh out the characters. Yeah, I mean, in a way... He's kind of like Soren in that regard, minus the god-awful emotional turmoil of his backstory. That character who starts off completely insufferable, but supports redeem him. Yeah, this is basically a solid recommendation for Revelations all round. And the rest of Fire Emblem Fates as well. Not sure why past me kept getting Revelations and Fates confused. But as always, I have a couple of nitpicks. Now, these aren't really bad points in any way, like, they don't make me hate the game, it's just that, well, I just feel the need to bring out these nitpicks so they aren't repeated in future and we can have an absolutely perfect Fire Emblem. So, first off, I should mention, just for the story purposes, he's kind of cool in Revelations, but in Birthright and Conquest, the Rainbow Sage is a cheap asshole. <laughs> I know, right? I offer incredible strength. Oh, did I say incredible strength? I meant one level. Bye. I, I meant one level and blacksmithing your sword. Uh, number two, Lilith is nice, but ultimately kind of pointless. She only exists to justify the My Castle feature, which is kind of cool if you're an online player. It gives you like a mini arena and... It's nice to have one area for all of the shops and see the characters wander about with extra bits of dialogue, but to be honest, a lot of the content feels kind of pointless, especially the My Headquarters and bonding mechanics, which... Hey. Yeah, uh, <laughs> special mention goes to the bonding mechanic. I mean, I'm glad they made it less skin crawlingly creepy than it was in the Japanese version, but it's still so tedious. Yeah, for those who, again, who have been in a deep role of us don't know what we're talking about, basically in the Japanese version, the bonding mechanic worked that you could invite someone into your room and then you could rub them with the stylus. In Fire Emblem's logic, the best way to make friends is to just rub them continuously. I can assure you right now, that is not how it works in real life. <laughs> I'm sorry, but even though Family Guy is a steaming pile of sh**, I've got to quote it right now. Giggity! <laughs> yeah, so in most Western releases, it's changed so that if it's below level S, you get the bonus to the support level between Corinne and that unit, and you get a bit of dialogue, but you don't have to do any rubbing. Unfortunately, when you do get to S rank, whilst it is a nice little bit of seeing a couple interact after they've got married, like I mentioned in a question last month, it doesn't change the fact that in order to fill the three big hearts, you've got to fill ten mini hearts, and you're not really doing anything to fill those, you just have to bond with them once and then hear the same lines of dialogue over and over and over again. I have to quote a tweet from a Fire Emblem video maker named Gast, who said, 
Hearing Mozu tell me how much she loved me lost its appeal after the 70th time. Yeah, and of course, just to break up the monotony, they still include a touchscreen minigames for your love interest, and uh, you might say that this entire minigame rubs me up the wrong way. <laughs> like that pun rubbed Jonah up the wrong way. Moving on. The final nitpick is... One of the most popular mechanics from Fire Emblem Awakening was the charm mechanic. Fire Emblem Awakening's story featured a lot of time travel. Specifically, one of its main characters came from an apocalyptic future where things turned sour. Whenever two characters gained an S-rank support and married each other, their child would come from the future to help out. Now, Fate's story doesn't involve time travel, so that would be a bit awkward. However, instead, they've come up with this slightly ridiculous mechanic that because they didn't want their children to get involved in the war, and by the way, that was a very quick conception, um... I know, right? That, unless they did the deed in the Deep Realms, I don't think pregnancies take that little time. Yeah, basically, they decided, okay, we want our child to be safe from the war, so we're going to store them in a Deep Realm. A completely separate one from the one my castle resides in. However, apparently Deep Worlds don't have consistency because... It turns out that the children have reached full-on maturity in about, oh, a couple of days, so... <laughs> uh, don't you hate it when you ever fertilize your plants? I mean, your kids. I mean, <laughs> I kind of lost track of that metaphor, but basically, just imagine a tomato plant growing in five hours. Yeah, so... It's a bit convoluted, but it was pretty much the only way they could justify the child mechanic, although part of me wonders if... It was really necessary because... Okay, well, there are two things about it that it kind of rubbed me up the... Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Jonan. <laughs> there are two things about it that kind of irk me. The first is that in Fire Emblem Awakening, it made sense for the kids to be involved with the main party because... They're from an apocalyptic future they're trying desperately to avoid, so it makes sense that they want to be a part of this action. And they're also desperate for this chance to reconnect with their parents, who they lost. In Fate, the children have no reason to be involved in this war, because it doesn't concern them other than the fact that their parents are involved, and... Well, frankly, they have so little time connecting with their parents, and frankly... A lot of them come off as, this is how not to raise your child! <laughs> Another fine name to add to the list of media with terrible parenting. It now joins the ranks of Naruto. Yeah, and the other thing is, usually I could forgive all of this if the child characters themselves were as interested in complex as their adult counterparts. Most of them aren't really. Yeah, I mean, Percy is a luchador, okay, cool. It's a gimmick that I love on the surface because I'm a fan of luchadors, but it can only go so far. And even worse than that, Hisame is just a pickle. I wish I was kidding. His entire character comes down to pickle puns. Yeah, and I kind of like Ophelia just because it kind of likes to see uh, someone picked up Odin's uh, nature for ham. But at the same time, I don't dislike any of the characters, it's just that they're okay. The only ones I dislike are the ones that... Well, let me put it this way. There are three characters that look a lot like the children from Fire Emblem Awakening. Selina, Odin, and Laszlo. However, the interesting twist, which I was not aware until Sven pointed it out to me, and became a massive fan of when I read some support logs on serenairsforest.net to confirm this. The reason for that is that they are the characters from Awakening. They have crossed dimensions and are currently working undercover for a mission that's not really explained. And it actually makes me really like it a lot more because now that we've introduced an Awakening that 
the worlds of Fire Emblem are connected. It's kind of a cool idea to have these characters traveling between worlds, seeing how much they've grown in some ways. Like, Selena, for example, she still has some dairy elements, but she has softened a bit so that she's not quite so harsh and annoying all the time, and she seems to have gotten over her mother issues, which is only a good thing, frankly. <laughs> yeah, needless to say, those issues were a source of a lot of problems in Awakening, namely her entire character. <laughs> but yeah, she's actually pretty cool, and in fact, there is one DLC conversation which was really freaking adorable, which is, okay, this is kind of a tantrum, but bear, bear with me. There is a DLC called Before Awakening, which is basically what happens when the Phase cast randomly leaps through a portal and ends up literally five minutes before the plot of Awakening actually starts. Oh my god, I have got to play this DLC already. Yeah, so it's basically you fighting alongside Krom, Lisa, and Frederick, literally before they find the unconscious Robin, and this is the interesting thing. If you have Selina in the party, she can go up and talk to Krom, and she then tells Krom, there's a Pegasus Knight in your ranks named Cordelia, right? You should probably go and have a cup of tea with her, maybe a chat. I'm sure she would really appreciate it. And then quietly by herself goes, please enjoy this gift, mum. Dad, please forgive me, but don't worry, I know she'll choose you in the end. My stony heart has just softened a little. <laughs> yeah, so get back on point, the fact that these characters cross over from, turns what could have easily been an incredibly lazy plot point into something that does open up potential which admittedly only gets explored in supports and actually is nice to see a subtle evolution of their characters. The fact that three of the children you can pick up from Fates are basically recolors of Cordelia, Gaius and Tarja respectively is just flat out lazy. <laughs> Yeah, and in fact, Cordelia's ex be Keldori. If you pair Subaki, Keldori's father, with Selena, you get the most hilarious line in Selena's support conversation with her daughter, where Selena is just completely upstaged by Keldori and, and mumbles to herself, Well, that's familiar. <laughs> yeah. It feels so lazy, I don't know why they bother to be honest, because it's really weird when you have a good example of how to do this and a bad example of how to do this all within the same bloody game. Yeah, it's just really jarring. Like you said, Odin, Laszlo, and Selina, their plot could very easily have made absolutely no sense or it could have just been a lazy reskin, and then you have the lazy reskins just three feet away. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the whole problem. Like, I appreciate it's there, it's just the characters themselves weren't that interesting. That the whole complex time mechanics makes me think maybe they really shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> Especially since I was trying so desperately to get to the end of Conquest plot before our first recording that in the end I just thought, you know what, <sighs> it, I'm not going to use the kids anyway, and I doubt I care that much about the supports. Let's just go to the end and ignore all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you really lose nothing. Nina I kind of like because she's a rebellious Robin Hood figure, and I always like rebellious Robin Hood figures. I like Shigure because, of course, they gave more development to Azura's son, but the rest of them you can kind of do without, <laughs> which is really sad. And while we're talking about nitpicks, very quickly I will mention one nitpick of mine. Even though there is a reason he behaves the way he does, Garen is so cartoonish, <laughs> he makes Ashnard look like Inspector Javert. Yeah, Garen is possibly the least subtle villain. Like, in his first encounter, uh, when uh, Corinne meets him for the first time in years, he goes, Yes, yes, very good. Now, uh, there's something I want you to do for me, Corinne. There are some prisoners. Kill them. What do you mean you don't want to kill them? Kill them before I kill you! Yeah, like, we've ranted about Ashnard before and how compared to Fire Emblem 9, possibly the greatest game in the series, he just stands out so hideously. Well, Fates to me is the second best game in the series as it stands, and Garen stands out even more sharply. Like, okay, 
I would understand the Norian princes and princesses following their father if he was in fact a good example of fatherhood. But there's one scene in Fire Emblem Revelations <laughs> where Leo and Xander have an exchange. Leo's standing outside the door to the throne room and Xander comes up to him. Leo remarks, you know, Xander, I think Corrin might have been onto something and I think there might be something wrong with our father. And Xander's like, what nonsense is this? You can't possibly be serious. Leo opens the throne room and... Garen has given up all pretenses and gone laughing mad. Like, <laughs> Kefka-style laughing mad. S just screaming laughter at the skies and ranting about how he's going to destroy both countries. <laughs> oh god, it's even worse than that. I got to that scene just a few days ago. It would be one thing if they were eavesdropping in a conversation and he didn't think that anything was going on. But when he says, I'm going to destroy both countries, Xander interrupts and goes, Wait, father, how could we say such a thing? He goes, Be quiet. You two should listen. This is important. We are going to burn the entire world to ash! <laughs> <laughs> like he's fully aware they're in the room, but he still thinks it is perfectly sane and logical for me to tell them that I plan to destroy the world. Be quiet. I'm being the Joker right now. <clears throat> <laughs> It gets to the point where even Iago, who is a stunning asshole even by Fire Emblem villain standards, I mean, he's basically Izuka from Fire Emblem 10, even, <laughs> even he, as Garen's advisor, remarks at one point, Okay, I know we're working toward this goal, this goal, your majesty, but dial it back! Yeah, okay, there's like one moment at the start of Conquest where they're trying to decide whether or not Curran's a traitor, and Garen goes... You know what? We should consult the Divine Dragon Arcanos for assistance. And Iago's reaction is just, You cannot be serious, your majesty. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's my major nitpick. I cannot take Garen seriously. I mean, Ashnard was annoyingly bad and annoyingly obvious in a really good plot, but Garen is just absurd. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Validar was a bad Nurgle XP. This guy is like if a 13-year-old fanfiction writer tried to write Ashnard. <laughs> yeah, that is a good way of putting it, unfortunately. But yeah, those are honestly the few weaknesses we had. And yeah, in an ideal world, we would have liked to have seen them improve. But... Honestly, like I said, that is just like a minor nitpick. If we actually did number scores, all they would take off would be like a 0 0.5. Fire Emblem Fates, all three games, because honestly I count them all as one experience, are just fantastic from start to finish. How would you rank these amongst your Fire Emblem titles, Sven? I mean, I know we like all of them, but if there was like a top three or a top five, how would you rank them? Path of Radiance, Fates, Awakening, Seven, and probably Fire Emblem 12? I mean, I liked Fire Emblem 5, but the difficulty curve was so steep it had an overhang. So, I can't rightly put that in my top 5 whenever it kicked my ass to Narnia. Yeah, that is true. So, in my case, it would probably be Path of Radiance, Fates in close second, followed, followed by Fire Emblem 7, Awakening and Radiant Dawn tied, because they're both good for different reasons, and then Fire Emblem 12 at the bottom, just because I haven't been able to play anything else that can put it above that. Yeah, that's fair enough. And I would rank Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn higher if, for one, Path of Radiance hadn't spoiled me, and for two, if the third act didn't make my stomach hurt, it was so bad. <laughs> yeah, basically. Long story short, if you're a fan of strategy games, I would definitely consider giving this a look, because it is a fantastic experience. And if you're a Fire Emblem fan, why haven't you bought it yet? Go. Go now. Buy it. Buy it. Buy it. If, of course, your bank account allows it, because recently mine has been sobbing, so I understand that pain. Okay, yes. Make sure you have enough for us to justify it in your life, and then buy it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Asta, not only is it a great game, but it's filled with a ton of content. I mean, I'm halfway through Revelations. In fact, at the time of recording, I've just finished Chapter 17 and I'm squeeing like mad. Um, 
And to think you haven't even gotten to the support that I recommend. Nope, that's my next port of call, along with finishing off the DLC and getting the Conquest Kids power logs. <laughs> I'm going to be playing this game for a long, long time. But first, we better finish this podcast off, so it's time to go into our final section. Quick Fire Reviews! This is the section where we review everything else we've read, watched, or played, but within the maximum time limit of 60 seconds. And I suppose I better get it out of the way, because otherwise people will be um, asking about it. Game of Thrones Series 6. Yes, I still watched it, even if it's only with half interest. Sadly, the cynicism continues, but a new quality is that apparently, aside from political movements and shocking plot twists, Game of Thrones cannot write normal plots for Toffee, as we've had training arcs and other such storylines get incredibly unsatisfying results, so ultimately, I think at this point I'm just going to be watching Game of Thrones to mock it, because admittedly, episode 10 sets up a cool note for the final season that looks like we're finally getting somewhere. I don't have any confidence that the finale will be worth all of the hype. Unfortunately so. <laughs> I mean... Well, I still watch it myself, even though I went on that blistering rant last year. <laughs> and this is the frustrating thing. It's like Bleach. I can still find parts that I like. I can still point out entire threads of the show that I really like. Like the acting, I still appreciate some of the characters, but the overarching plot? Bullsh- <laughs> Oh, jeez. Before I go on, Sven, do you have anything you want to review? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you've already reviewed it once on this channel, but I finally got a chance to play it for myself, and I mean play it above five frames per second, so <laughs> I'll get it out of the way. Dragon Age Inquisition, which I could finally play on my new Lenovo. Yes, that is a shameless plug. So my feelings came over, ready for war, and then died in a tornado. But then I had a nice time chatting with the Chargers and then died in a tornado. Seriously, this game is amazing. Yep, indeed. I don't know if I review the game on this channel, but I did review it on my Twitter. Yes, that is another shameless plug. Please, pay our social media attention. Oh, yes. And I've got two reviews, which funnily enough refer back to things you've mentioned. First off... The latest chapters of Bleach. Really? We've devolved to this level. We've devolved to some seriously broken powers of I can just change the future because... Oh, everything you do to me, I can reverse and do to you. Yeah, well, guess what? My power allows me to reverse the reversing you've already done. Oh, and of course, in this recent chapter, we've repeated the same stick of, oh, we started fights but can't be bothered to finish them, so the villain just kills them all for us. Seriously, what the hell? This is getting done by the second. What's the saddest part for me about this entire arc is that there have been hints at good things happening. Like, Rukia perhaps getting development, which was then hijacked by the Akia. Ordu and Orihime possibly getting development, but then, of course, Ichigo happened. <laughs> and I would mention Chad, but Kubo has forgotten he exists. Just flat out forgot. Yeah, basically. And the funny thing is, from what I'm hearing, at the time of recording, there's only about five to ten chapters left in this series, so Kubo's gonna have to do a lot to finish it up in that time. Although... I think even though we've made our opinions on the series clear, when it does finish, we are definitely going to review it on this podcast, just to close it out like we did with Naruto. Yeah, and I feel like, after all the complaining I've done, there should at least be a chance for me to justify why I used to like the series. <laughs> and let me just say, the se Bleach has not even ended, but I am already declaring Kishimoto the winner of the ending game. <laughs> oh gods, yes. This is assuming that One Piece never ends. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> it probably won't at this rate. <laughs> well, I'm now going to talk about a completely different Shonen series. My Hero Academia, which has recently gained an anime adaptation, but I'm talking more about the manga because that's what I've read. This is a really, really fun series. If you like superheroes or just Shonen series in general, this is a great pickup, as so far... It has managed to avoid all of the mistakes that have tied down other shonen shows. It has a great cast, which does get development, or at the very least, their time to shine. It has a really likable hero, and it has some gut-punching moments, and, and it also ties back to another question in that there are cynical moments that happen, but in the end, positivity and the best of humanity triumph. So, yeah, fully recommend this if you're a fan of shonen manga, or you just want to watch or read a fun action series. Recommendation taken, because I desperately need anime. <laughs> I think it's currently being streamed by Funimation, and they're actually doing a simul dub for it, with Chris Sabat currently playing All Might, aka possibly the hammiest mentor you've ever seen. 
Nature Armstrong strikes again. Also, speaking of ham, I've just uh, recalled two series that I can review while we're here. Okay, then. Wow, this is going to be a big podcast. to get your money's worth, people. Critical Role, which I'm pretty sure Jonan has already reviewed once on Quickfire Reviews. Oh my god, I never thought D&D could be so fun. Just everything about Grog. Also, Critical Role just proves to me that Liam O'Brien is an embarrassingly good actor. Oh god, yes. <laughs> D&D and voice actors, it kind of crosses two of our favorite nerddoms out. It really does, and it also leads me into my second review. Tabletop, directed by Will, Butt Monkey of the Gods Wheaton. Basically, just imagine Critical Role scaled down to uh, one-shot tabletop games. It's less dramatic and doesn't showcase uh, acting so much, but it is absolutely hilarious. I will definitely check that out. And on that positive note, that brings us to the end of what has been a very fun episode, even if it did take us two tries to get here. Ah, if at first you don't succeed, try, 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 try again until the curse wears off. Indeed. As always, thanks for listening to the show, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section. That's what it's there for. But until next month, I've been the Journey Monkey. And I've been Sven the Crusader. Roll well, my friends. That was Monkey Broadcast, a monthly review and discussion show hosted by the Journey Monkey and Sven the Crusader. If you feel you've been the subject of slander or that your copyright is misused, send an email to thejourneymonkey at yahoo.co.uk. For more news and media reviews, follow me on Twitter at thejourneymonkey and go to thejourneymonkey.poppy.com for previous podcasts and every free downloads. All music used belongs to the original owners. Until next month, have fun kids! <laughs> <laughs>